You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hey there, y'all. This is Juliet Miranda. You are listening to episode number 79 of the Unwritable Rant podcast. I've got my bourbon in hand, and you know what that means. Right now, it is time to fill up a glass with something delicious, raise it up, and toast to this episode. Cheers, y'all. Oh, that is delicious. Y'all, today I am drinking Hirsch Small Batch Reserve Bourbon. This is a blended bourbon. It's very high on the corn with a lovely balance of rye and malt. I've got mine on the rocks, which I find is the best way to drink this bourbon because it really gives it a chance to open up. At first, it tastes a little floral, but then once it settles down a little bit, you get this incredible blend of vanilla and caramel and gingerbread. It's got kind of a sweet and spicy sort of blend, and it is fantastic. And I gotta say, it reminds me just a little bit of today's guest. Now, admittedly, he's a little bit higher on the spicy end, but today I am talking to comedian Nick DiPaolo. This New York comedian has several stand-up specials. His most recent is called Inflammatory. He's performed on The Tonight Show, Late Night with David Letterman, and he's been nominated twice for an Emmy for his writing on HBO's The Chris Rock Show. Beyond that, Nick is also an actor. He was on Louie, the 12 Angry Men episode of Amy Schumer, as well as The Sopranos, and even right now, he is in the new Robert De Niro movie, The Comedian. So we have a lot to talk about in this interview. And I gotta say, he is sharp, he is hysterical, and we had a great talk. Nick is awesome. So you know what to do, folks. Kick back, and let's enjoy this conversation with Nick DiPaolo. Well, Nick, You are known as one of the most authentic and honest voices in comedy. Is it getting harder to do that with audiences today? (laughs) It's always been hard. I don't know. They seem to like the soft, fluffy shit they always have. I don't, and I'm serious, I don't know how to do it any other way. I don't, I defend a very unpopular stance right now, white, straight males. Developed my act in New York City, so that's not, those are not the easiest audiences. (laughs) Seeing as I've been around and I've for so long in New York, like you know, if I go to the Comedy Cellar or the Stand or these local clubs, and the, the a lot of the kids who come in know what to expect from me because they've seen me on Comedy Central and stuff. So it kind of breaks the ice a little bit. Well, sure. But yeah, they're a little they're a little fucking touchy. <laughs> well, I mean, like you said, you've you've been doing this, you know, since the boom in the eighties. <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> The 1880s. Yes, I opened the... <laughs> you look remarkable. Yeah, well, you know, plastic surgery. I lived in L.A. for five years. So. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> but, yeah, I've been around, so... <laughs> well, you know, what's changed since then? I mean, clearly you have the same approach. I mean, is it the people that are changing? Well, yeah. I mean, this country is just, you know, the mainstream... Me, I don't want to get too political because I'm not... You know, and again, I, I use this quote, Colin Quinn explained it the best. I said, I'm not a political comic. Why do they keep trying to pigeonhole me as I can say? And he goes, well, he goes, let's put it this way. You're not a political comic, <laughs> but Colin Quinn says, but, you know, you could be telling a joke about McDonald's and people can tell how you voted. So, <laughs> 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 Which I thought was a good way of explaining it. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, this country's going so, you know, is the, the media, we're so media driven and that's what it is. People form their opinions and their values from, you know, television and movies. And and that slants away from how I think sensitivity is in and fucking safe spaces and which makes me puke. So it it, it makes it fun and it makes it irritating at the same time, you know? Well, yeah. And I think the problem is that there's a lack of critical thinking. You know, people are going to a comedy show. You know, you're, you're not expecting somebody to be giving you a sermon. Yes. Absolutely. And I don't do that. I always, the funny has to come first. Otherwise you turn into Janine Garofalo. 
<laughs> <laughs> I say that kidding. I actually love Janine and I love her comedy. We started together in Boston. She's like a year ahead of me. And, and my friends can't believe that I like her comedy, which I do. And I like her. But I'm just saying she went through a period uh, where she seemed to get a little preachy. <laughs> and, uh, but she was always smart and funny. And, and, you know, at least I found it. And my friends think I just say that because I was attracted to her 10 years ago. <laughs> nothing, Juliet. Hello. I'm not going uh, there. <laughs> I got nothing. Oh, like 20 years ago. Um, but no, you know what I mean. So uh, yeah, things are changing. I mean, people are. I don't know. They just this the country's so media driven. You know what I noticed? Like people are so because of social media, they all think you know they think they're TV stars with their faggy fake Facebook friends and shit. Well, yeah, they all think they have a voice. Yeah, and they fucking shouldn't. How's that for Nazism? Uh, but no, they should. But they should. They should have a voice. They just shouldn't use it as much. I don't really give a shit that you're at Burger King on Tuesday at three in the afternoon, feeding a pigeon. Who gives a fuck? Unless you shoot up the place, I don't want to see it live. All right. Hey, that was kind of funny. I'm gonna put that in my act. Yeah, write that down. Yeah, so, but I notice, like, uh, they're in comedy clubs, like, before the show starts, they don't even hesitate about, like, going up on stage and taking a picture behind the microphone. You know what I mean? Like, kind of a disrespect for it. I, I, because we're so, nobody's shy anymore. You know what I mean? Or if you talk to somebody in the audience, they'll grab the mic right out of your hand. I remember when I first went to a comedy club before I was a comedian, I would never, you know what I mean? Used, people used to be afraid to get up to take a piss during a set. Now they'll walk right on the stage to get to the bathroom. That's incredible. I mean, where's the boundary now? Uh, I don't know. It, to me, it's getting blurred. And again, because of social media. And it's, I'm not saying it's all bad. It, social media is great. So you know, I can tell people where I'm going to be and whatnot. But I'm amazed at some of my comic friends. Every time I you know, pick up the phone and, and check whatever, Instagram or Twitter, they're fucking on there doing something. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, do, these, do they ever talk to anybody? But then I'm thinking, wait a minute, they're stand-up comics. So no, they're probably alone <laughs> in their shitty apartment all day. <laughs> I, I wish I was better at the technology. Luckily, I have a, a, my wife is, you know, 40 times smarter than me. And I'm not just saying that to be PC. It's true. And I said, please, immerse yourself in how to market me on Facebook. And she did for like three weeks. Didn't come out of her office. So that's the positive aspect. But... Everybody has a voice now, and we're so divided. It's just, it's it's wearing me out, you know? Well, you seem to be doing all right. I mean, you've managed to figure out how to put up a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask Rob Sprantz, the guy who taught me. <laughs> he's, he's getting out of rehab next week, I think. <laughs> Did you put him there? <laughs> yeah, of course. That's what I meant. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was three years ago he taught me. But uh, I'm always calling him going, hey, uh, this thing won't record. What the fuck? <laughs> and he, he's at work. He's at work, and like at a new job. And he's like, I can't talk right now. I'm like, bullshit. I got to do a podcast. He's like, figure it out. We do that join me thing. You know, he gets on so he can look at my computer. Oh, sure, sure. He's like, hey, uh, when's the last time you plugged in your computer, you dumb greaseball? I'm like, okay. <laughs> Don't talk to me like that, bitch. <laughs> you know, the podcast is my favorite thing right now. I got to be honest with you. I, I, and I'm glad Rob taught me, riotcast.com. And, and can I just give myself a plug here? Yeah, have at it. You can hear my podcast on iTunes on Monday for free. But if you like it, you can subscribe at connectpal.com slash Nick. Uh, and you get two to three more shows a week for three ninety nine a month. I treat it like a radio show. It's very topical. You know, most of it's ripped right out of the headlines. But I, I pull my own sound clips, the sound effect. It's it's sort of like Howard Stern meets a political show. It's People are digging it. I am pleasantly surprised at uh, the response. And I, I go down to my you know my office, and it's like it's like doing an hour of comedy. I prepared, although I prepare the podcast like for one hour show, I'll prepare for two and a half, three hours. You know, I treat it like a radio show. So but people are digging it, and. Uh, well, yeah, I love it. It's way more off the cuff than I expected. A lot of people have these very polished podcasts where they go out, they know. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you, you lay in sometimes. It's awesome. Yeah, and that's the fun of it. Why the fuck would you want to, you know, the, the, the beauty, the nature of a podcast, to me, and the, the biggest thing, the biggest advantage is what? Your speech is totally free, at least for now. 
I, I've done radio. I've done terrestrial radio. I had a, a you know a terrestrial show for a short while, like in 2008, and I've done you know I, I still do Jimmy Norton show and those guys and Ron Bennington satellite radio where you can say, but you can still get in trouble over there because it's a corporate environment. But when you're in when you're in your own house, you know, uh, who's my boss? My wife? Come on. <laughs> well, not when it comes to radio, at least. <laughs> yeah, but, she's not censoring your content. <laughs> yeah, she's not censoring my comedy. She's telling me to wipe my feet and to fucking <laughs> get the hairs out of the sink. But she doesn't care. I'm going on a rant. So, but that's the beauty of a podcast. So, it, it may come off as you know unpolished, but that's. But I do, like I said, I'll, I'll prepare. I'll read and make notes and shit for a couple hours before I actually do the show. Then I do wing it, like you said, but I do my homework first. And yeah, it's been, it's been a godsend. It's really funny. And now uh, I'm, in ta- I'm talking with Sirius Radio. I did a week for them back in October, right before the election. And they, you know, they're, they want to know if I want to do a show over there. So we're kicking that around. You know, so uh, it's good times right now for me, you know. Yeah, you've got a lot going on. You've got a another comedy special that's going to be coming out, inflammatory. That's right, uh, February sixteenth on CISO, which uh, I said, "What the hell is CISO?" And the guy, <laughs> and Brian Volkweis, who who is like the CEO, he goes, uh, "It's a Comcast version of Netflix, so it's a streaming service. You probably know because you're into comedy, but." The streaming service and uh, and Doug Stanhope has already done a special on there. I think Janine did, Brian Poussain, uh, a few other, Tom Papa maybe. So yeah, February sixteenth, inflammatory. I, I have a phone call with them at twelve thirty. Uh, no, twelve forty-five here. Um, are you in LA? No, I'm in Chicago. Oh, you're in Chicago, where I'm headed next week. Yes, you are playing in uh, Rosemont. I'm playing uh, Thursday night in you know downtown, and then yeah, on the weekend I'm in Rosemont. Friday and Saturday. Yeah, the special, I'm excited. I shot it in a theater in uh, Riverhead, New York, which is Long Island. Beautiful, this ornate theater in the middle of nowhere. This town is kind of like kind of run down. You might have seen it on lockup, and I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm Sounds not lovely. <laughs> they, have, they did an episode from Riverhead. I almost shit my pants. I go, I have to do my special. It sounds like my people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, CISO's putting it out there and... Uh, February 16th. I'm excited. It came out. It looks beautiful, and the, the crowd was great. It was a perfect size theater, like 400 people. Is this all new material? It's new to, it'll be new to the public, but it's stuff I've been working on for a couple of years, you know? You know what I mean? You don't turn out a special every three months. Some people do. <laughs> How do they do that? I, I mean, I have enough trouble coming up with podcast content. I mean, that's, that's hard work. How do they do that? Well, it's very easy. They turn out a very mediocre product and don't give a fuck. Ah, indeed. But even like, you know, like Billy Bird, he uh, he takes a couple of years, and uh, I do too. I mean, my last one was released in January of 14. I released that on my own, and it worked so well. I went styrofoam. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's been about three years. So uh, it's it's hard. Look, I you know I, I'm not out there slugging it out every day like a comic in his twenties, you know. So I work out a lot of stuff on the road. As opposed, I, I don't live in New York City anymore. I live about forty miles north. So it's uh, I don't go into the city every night like I used to. Sounds a little bit more calm. Yeah, exactly. So and that's where I used to work out all my stuff at the Comedy Cellar and the Stand and. Now I kind of wait till I go on the road, like, you know, in Chicago. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll use them as a, a guinea pig, and they'll hate the show. And I'll go, but wait for the special. It'll be out in six years. You'll love it. It'll come together, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> no, I'm you, it's a balancing act. You have your proven material. You do some of that. And, but I pick a spot in the hour set or whatever to work on new stuff. That's how. Brian Regan told me that years ago. Uh, and this is when he still lived on the East Coast. He goes, I don't drive into the city anymore. I forget where he was living. He goes, I work my shit out on the road. But but he, you know, he's in demand on the road. He'd be on the road every weekend, you know? Right, right. So, and, and that's what stand-up is. I mean, it's repetition and, and you know, working out the kinks. It, it, it's, it's an art form. And it just, I, I like, stand-up is still my favorite, but broadcasting, radio, and, and podcast, I, I like, uh, you know, it's neck and neck for me. I love being funny conversationally, which I'm not proving in this interview. But listen, folks. <laughs> well, okay, so 
every comedian that I've ever talked to has been incredibly hesitant to call himself a writer, yet you've totally bridged that divide. I mean, you know, with your work on the Chris Rock show, the Academy Awards. How do you make that transition? Writing for yourself, writing for others. Is one easier? I don't really consider myself a, if, a writer either, because if I, if I was, I would have put out two or three books by now. I'm just not disciplined enough. And my thoughts are all over the place. It's organization. I just don't, I don't have those, I don't have the, I don't have the discipline. Like uh, Colin Quinn can com- compartmentalize. The guy can be working on a, he'll be writing stand up, working on a one man show and writing a, a web series at the same time. You know, I, I just don't have that discipline, but I did. Yeah. Chris Rock. I, I, I knew Chris's voice. And I got hired over there. Louis had worked at Louis C.K., who's my old buddy. And Louis, you know, told Chris, this guy's, you know, a fucking funny writer. And, and Chris was smart enough to go, his politics, Chris was, you know, obviously knew my politics were the polar opposite of his. <laughs> of and, and I loved Giuliani, and he hated Giuliani. But he was smart enough, he knew he'd have to have somebody on his staff to uh, present the other side and stuff. That wasn't that tough for me because I knew Chris's voice and I was a fan of his comedy. The best example of that when I was writing for Chris, do you remember when um, somebody broke up with Ellen DeGeneres? Do you oh, remember who her first oh, girlfriend um, and she went kind of nuts? I do remember that. She knocked on it. She was knocking on people's doors like strangers. Remember she lost her mind? Yeah, yeah. She was like wandering the streets. Yes. So I remember, and, and, I, and I, I saw that news story, and I and literally pictured Chris doing the joke. So I wrote this joke, and, of course, <laughs> and he opened with it, and I was so proud of it. Uh, so he mentions the Ellen's, Ellen's uh, girlfriend. Uh, Ellen broke up with her, and uh, she's banging on doors and, and, and scaring people in the middle of the night. Just proves one thing, whether you're a man or a woman, lack of pussy make you crazy. <laughs> I, I just... <laughs> I just could picture him saying that. And sure enough, I handed that joke in. And that night, like it was his first or second joke in his monologue, and it fucking murdered. But, but you know, he had such a distinct voice. Uh, I don't know that I could write, you know, for everybody. It'd be hard for me to write for Seth Meyers or something. Well, it's two entirely different kinds of comedy. Yeah, that too. But uh, that was, you know, Chris's, I wrote for his show on HBO. I didn't, didn't write his stand-up. Some people think... But then, you know, he had me when he, the first time he hosted the Oscars, I was flattered that he had me uh, on the staff. What was that like? I mean, what's the situation like when you were writing, you know, sketches for the Oscars? Uh, I was more, I was more on the monologue side, you know, I, that's what I did when I was at HBO for Chris, me, me and Frank Sebastiano, we would write six pages of monologue jokes to everybody else's too, because they were writing sketches and stuff, you know? Uh, we, we loved writing the monologue jokes, so that's why he really brought me along. But I was flattered that at the Oscars, the first time that he hosted, he only he chose three of us. It was a staff of like ten or eleven. He chose three of us to be behind the curtain with him with him that night, down you know on the floor. And he chose me, Richard Jenny, and Jeff Stilson, who was like the producer. So I you know I was flattered, but I, I didn't. I, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, I didn't get anything on that night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a great joke about, uh, and they, they did it in rehearsal, and I was so excited, about Tim Robbins was one of the presenters. Uh huh. I said, Tim Robbins hates Republicans so much, he brings his kids to the circus every year just so they can spit at the elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Which the whole room cracked up. It was in, it was in the goddamn... It was in the goddamn teleprompter two minutes before showtime. Next thing I know, it, it, it's cut. Oh, no. Oh, that's tragic. So I don't know. Well, what are you going to do? I, I don't know. All I know is I got a gift basket after the show we all did with like $40,000 worth of stuff in it. Well, all right. That's not so bad. <laughs> I don't give a shit if they use any of my jokes. <laughs> you got a consolation prize. It's all good. <laughs> I'm going to Hawaii and I get free... Uh, <laughs> Free blue buffalo dog food in the basket. <laughs> well, so <laughs> in addition to, you know, you're writing, you're also quite the actor these days. You were in The Comedian with Robert De Niro. I, you know, I don't even tell anybody that because it was such a tiny thing. But yeah, I mean, it's coming out today. I'm thinking about after I do my interviews here, running over to a local theater because I, I, again, I, I lean right in my politics. I haven't seen a movie in years. I just can't get past the 
the political correct, you know, Hollywood. Uh, I, I just can't, I can't suspend my disbelief enough to watch like Angelina Jolie beat up eight male Marines. <laughs> just fucking, I, I can't buy it. Yeah, I had a tiny scene with De Niro. I'm sitting home and I get a call from SD, who, SD, you know, SD, she runs the Comedy Cellar in New York City. She goes, uh, Nick, would you like to be in a, a movie with Robert De Niro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go to the batting cages. No, I'm busy. Thanks, though. I'm going to the batting cages. My dog has to take a dump, so I, I don't have time for that, Esty. But um, I'm like, yeah, what the fuck? And this is the day before. So they call me, and uh, I go down there, and she, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll be in a, in a movie with De Niro, but he's not going to be in the scene. I'm, I get down there, and they're like, no, you're in a scene with him. You, Jim Norton. and, and Whoa. And Hannibal Burris, and they didn't even have sides for me. I get down there, or they emailed me, and I didn't get them, or whatever. So it was me, Jim Norton, and, and Hannibal Burris, and Esty, the woman who runs the comedy cell. She's like a seventy-year-old Israeli woman, and it was so fun. It was fun. So we were sitting around, and yeah, I have a quick little scene with with De Niro. We yell insults at him, and, and you know, at the table as he's walking by. But it was so funny because Esty is Israeli. She has, still has an accent. She's the one who books the comedians, the comedy seller. It's so funny. She's in the scene. We do the first scene, and then the director goes, Esty, I think you stepped on Ro- uh, Robert's line, meaning De Niro. Esty goes, no, I did not. I think he came in too quick. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Taylor Hackford, the director, goes, you know what? You're right. <laughs> oh, whoa. Holy crap. <laughs> Which I fucking, that's why I love Esty. So that, that was the highlight of the day for me, Esty correcting the director. And even De Niro going, no, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> After the, our little scene, me, me and Norton got to uh, sit there and talk to De Niro for like 20 minutes. I'm like real shy. Even when I see somebody, I just don't want to bother anybody, even though I had a right to. I was in a scene with him. But, you know, Jimmy Norton's right there. He's like, come here. So De Niro sat between us and we're trading stories for like 20 minutes. And I told De Niro, I go, yeah. And he's telling me in, his, his, in the movie, his character punches somebody in the audience. I go, that happened to me twice. Then he was like, really? <laughs> and then I read the New York Times and Jessica Curson. There's a review and then there's an article related to the review saying how De Niro prepared. And Jessica Curson, God bless her. She's the one who actually, I think, invited me to do the little scene. But she said they were talking about De Niro's character, Jackie Burke. She said, I think it's more like Nick DiPaolo. Wow. <laughs> Which I was flattered to, you know. I was flattered to hear, uh, but I'm like, okay, but he's 73 in the movie. You know, I'm fucking 55. Give me a break. You can cut that part out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was kind of flattered that Jessica, you know, I'm not an insult comic. That's what Jackie Burke is in the movie. I, I think that doesn't do anybody any good when they call somebody an insult. I don't even know what that means. You know what I mean? If somebody heckles me, yeah, I'm going to insult them in, in, in a funny way. But uh, You're not Don Rickles. Yeah, no, exactly. No, I do I do material and it's conceptual and funny and but I can be vicious if I have to be, but but they like to they they come up with these labels, you know. Oh he's an insult comic. I remember I was being interviewed, uh Geraldo Rivera, right after Greg Geraldo died. And Geraldo used that term, insult comic and I go, That's such a disjustice uh, to to uh, to how good he was, you know? And uh whatever. Well, there seems to be a lot of labels being put on comedy these days. I mean, if you look at things like, you know, the alt comedy scene, it's it's kind of getting very segregated. Now it's alt right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's where they'll throw me, you know. I don't give a, and you know what? I don't give a shit. I wear it like a badge of courage. People who know me and love me know, you know, you got to say stuff. It's so, it's it's really bizarre. You're right. And this is where... I think I'm also a little similar to De Niro's character. Your audiences change, you know? Right. And like you asked me at the beginning, you know, whether it's, oh, he's a, he's a you know, misogynist or racist. And, and if you're a fucking, if you're a white, straight guy doing comedy and you haven't been called that a few times, and then you, you, you're not, you're just going along with the flow. And because when somebody calls you racist, misogynist, it doesn't mean it's true. That's their definition. I mean, if you disagree, if you disagree with Obama, they called you a racist. It had nothing to do with race, you know, if you disagree with his policy. So like you said, there's a lot of labels out there. But alternative comedy, you know, to me, it's a bunch of kids 
who get a bunch of people who think just like them together in Brooklyn. Where, where's the challenge in that? That's why I still like the clubs like The Stand and the Comedy Cellar and the Fat uh, Black Pussycat down in the village. Because when you go on there, you know, you, you get a table of Dominicans, a table from Germany, uh, people from Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. You get the diversity. Yeah, and they're the ones always preaching diversity. Yeah, if you go to one of these alternative shows, everybody... They all, you know, they all look alike. They have their ironic beards and fucking wearing those faggy leather bracelets around their wrists, whatever that signifies. <laughs> I think that means I got beat up in gym class or some shit like that. You know what I mean? It's a bunch of fucking victims, and, and they hate guys like me. I don't even go to the – I'm probably missing out on it. But you know what? I've, I've wandered into a, a few of those rooms a couple of years ago, and they, and they treated me well. But a lot of that alternative stuff, it's like it's like uh, long stories that are mediocrely funny with like a, a little bit of music here and there. Yeah, th- there's no actual hook. You know, you, you don't get pulled into it. It's like listening to somebody's, you know, long-winded podcast. Yes. And, and, and I have a theory about that because to me, it's still about jokes. I don't mean like Rodney Dangerfield one-liners, but... This still should be a setup and a payoff somewhere, and and, and you know it takes a little balls to do a setup and a punchline because the punchline might not work. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And and, and uh, it's almost like being afraid you're going to be rejected. So I, who can't tell a, a twenty minute amusing story where people chuckle politely eight times? I don't know. I, whatever. But but again, there's, there's the young guys. I listen to satellite radio. There's a lot of funny young guys out there. Really funny. Kyle Kinane, I think. Is that his name? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. T.J. Miller. Who the hell else did I... Oh, I love Maria Bamford, too. My wife sort of... I've known, you know, her... I know Maria because, you know, we've been around a long time. I don't know her personally, but I've known her act, but I never really listened to a lot of it. You know what I mean? And then I kept hearing her on satellite radio, and, and she's brilliantly funny, and that Netflix show is really hilarious. So I'm still a politically incorrect i don't do that to, intentionally it's just my nature i'm gonna say something that might ruffle feathers and get a laugh to me that's the perfect joke so but what do i know this is why i hate doing these interviews because eight <laughs> minutes into it you, any comic doing it sounds like a pretentious asshole and i think <laughs> well yeah i gotta say on that same vein it is really difficult to interview a comedian yeah because what am i gonna say how do you write your jokes you know you're not gonna tell me that <laughs> <laughs> Nick, you know, I heard you're on a unicycle. You, 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 you reinvented yourself. You're shooting bottle rockets out of your ass. And uh, then you tell a couple jokes and you get back on the unicycle. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it, it's, tough. it's a tough interview. But luckily I had four cups of coffee. You seem to be in good spirits, so this is good. Yeah, and it's just caffeine. The minute this wears off, I'm like a guy who just did an eight ball of Coke. <laughs> and he's coming down, and nobody wants to be around him. At the... <laughs> you got me right after my fourth cup. Sweet. I got the sweet spot. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, you got the sweet spot. Exactly. <laughs> my poor wife will deal with her fallout later. <laughs> oh, that's her problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's her. You're goddamn right it is. I don't know what she was thinking. People, my wife, I, you know, I bring her to, like, once in a while, I bring her to a party once every seven years. Nice. It, it, it's like Goodfellas. No, it's like Goodfellas. Uh, <laughs> uh, remember, uh, there's a scene in Goodfellas. Somebody like Joe Pesci or somebody brings their their wife or whatever, and the, and the other mobs, because, I, you know, <laughs> the other mobs who's known Joe Pesci's character for 30, I didn't think he had a wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see, like, people looking at my wife. Like, I think I know her. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they're looking at her going, how the fuck does she deal with this guy? How could you marry a guy so opinionated? And, and you know, let's be honest. When you've you know, little outspoken as a white male today, that makes you an asshole automatically. Well, it keeps things interesting. <laughs> it's exactly how I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most important thing in this interview is my podcast at connectpal dot com slash nick. If you again, it's for everybody, but I'm sure you know if you're a liberal, you're gonna you're gonna go, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it's not. It's not all politics. It's not. It's more cultural. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah. I listen to it all the time. You, you've got a great balance. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I, I try to keep it that way. It, it's way more political than I thought. But I didn't know. How did I know that uh, we we're gonna have the most interesting election? 
and the history of this country. And, and you know, I'm, what, am I going to ignore that? The guy who won is sort of, uh, you know, people are, it's just so weird. <laughs> I can't help it, though. It's so interesting. You pick up the paper. I got to talk about it. I know. I know. Right? I, I don't want to become like a totally political comic who's, you know, breaking down how a vote went on the Senate floor yesterday. I'll, I'll never do that shit. That stops being comedy. Yeah. I mean, uh, unless you have a TV show on HBO and, and, and 12 staff writers. Exactly. Like like Bill Maher. And then, he, you know, he does it well for for his side. He does it very well and stuff. But, yeah, people don't come out to zanies. To, uh, but like I said, and like Colin Quinn says, I, no matter what I'm talking about, they can see. Because if you're being honest up there, you attack subjects that piss you off. And a lot of the subjects that piss me off are stuff that, like, you know, Hillary Clinton approved. So it just happens to be that way. <laughs> it just works out that way. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chicago. Let me tell you. I used to do, was it the Funny Farm years ago? Uh, they used to have me there, Christ, twice a year when I was, like, in, in the 90s when I first started. And uh, Zanies, I absolutely love. Um, those audiences, they come out ready to have a good time, unlike a lot of cities. Yeah, especially in the winter. Yeah. I have loved them. And they don't, yeah, especially in the winter, exactly. You see people with, actually, they, they sneeze and the nose comes off in their handkerchief. And it's like <laughs> blue with blood on it. And a lot of coughing of phlegm in between yes. jokes. <laughs> yeah, you walk out of Chicago remembering it. <laughs> There's a lady with a spittoon. Oh, She's like in her 60s, spitting Louis <laughs> into the spittoon after each job. But, yeah, no, Chicago, I, I absolutely, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't like fucking doing the road anymore. I'm tired of going to airports and the morning radio and stuff. But Chicago, those audiences, like I said, they, they come ready to laugh and they seem to dig the politically incorrect stuff. At least the people that come out to see me, uh, maybe they know what's coming, you know, but I've, 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 I've always said it. And, and my next special, if I do another one, I, I want to do it in Chicago. Oh, you absolutely should. I, I honest to God, I want to find a nice theater in, in Chicago or a small room that holds 11. And, um, I got a basement. Um. <laughs> do you? <laughs> sure. You probably do. There's, there's comedians now, like in Brooklyn, and <laughs> that that I, I see them on Facebook. They they literally set up. They're standing on a suitcase in their in their one bedroom apartment, and and there's like eight friends around, and they're doing. Crime. That seems so disconcerting. I don't know if I could stand like that close in such an intimate space, like a living room, and watch that. I'd I'd feel very awkward. You know, that's very, it's funny you say that because the comedy cellar uh, is like those room, comedy cellar is very intimate. It's like Zany's downtown, only even a little more intimate with a lower ceiling. And, and it's, the room is way shallower. At the, and you know what? Even when I, in my heyday, when I used to kill down there during the tough crowd days, there were nights where I had bad nights because I don't always smile when I, I'm on stage and sometimes... You know, making a joke about whatever. If you don't say it with a little bit of a smile on your face, they get like horrified. And there were there were nights where I just didn't bother trying to fake the smile, and I'd have a horrible night. I need at least uh, forty yards between me and the front row. <laughs> well, especially in Chicago, you know, you don't want to like get caught by something flying in the air. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but uh, the, but the intimacy, yeah. Some of the rooms, like the cellar, it, it keeps you honest, though. People can read your faces. Yeah, you're not going to hide anything. Yeah, and my face doesn't. My face never matches my emotions. Sometimes, like Bill Hicks used to do a bit. People used to come up to him. What's wrong? You know. I, I I hear that five times a day, my whole life. Christ, like in fifth grade, people would say that to me. What's wrong? I'm like, well, I should be in seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there, fuck face. Yeah, you're talking to me. That's what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's number two. <laughs> what do you fucking bother me for? I was enjoying my Twinkie. Well, Nick, I got I to gotta wrap this up. Is there anything else that you want to plug, talk about, cover? Yeah, just, well, no, just hit me up on Twitter, at Nick DiPaolo, same for, uh, you know, Instagram, and uh, what else is there? Twitter, Instagram, I'm forgetting. Are you on Facebook? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of an important one. <laughs> it's a big uh, one. Yeah, Nick, at Nick DiPaolo, I guess, on Facebook, all those, my numbers are, you know, I make a couple political jokes, and I'm losing friends like it's the Holocaust, for Christ's sake. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, hit me up on all those, especially at Twitter. I like the ethnic the power. But uh, my podcast, again, uh, Connect Pal, 
That's connectpal.com slash Nick. I'm telling you, you'll love it. You can listen to it for free at iTunes on Monday. And if you like it, you can sign up there. I think that's it in the big special, uh, Inflammatory, on February 16th. It's on CISO. Perfect. So I think that covers it. Julia, this has been great. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a blast talking to you. I really thank you for talking. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, Nick. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. You can hear new episodes of The Unwritable Rant on RadioVegas.rocks every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern and on IPMNation.com on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern and hear best of episodes every weekday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning Standing on the corner at Carondelet What you say we make our way up to Bourbon a Couple hurricanes and a hand grenade And get blown away Let the chips fall where they may If it's all the same What you say bon ton Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this 